All right. Good morning, uh, folks. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Sydney Saxophone Network Q&A series. Uh, I am your host, uh, Nathan Henshaw. Uh, for all of you in Sydney this morning, I uh, hope you're staying dry. It is a little bit uh, wet and miserable outside, but we hope you had a good week. And um, I mean, the weekend's probably not that promising, but you know, hopefully it's going to be a, a nice weekend for everyone out there. Now, a nice way to ease into the weekend is, of course, having a Q&A session. And this this morning's guest, uh, we're very uh, privileged to have one of the greats in the Australian jazz scene with us this morning. Um, uh, he's sort of half half in Sydney and half in Brisbane, and he's currently in Brisbane at the moment. But um, I'm sure you would have recognised his face from uh, here, there, and everywhere. Um, this morning we have the esteemed jazz saxophonist David Thick. Now, for those who don't know Dave, uh, Dave's a uh, prolific performer, uh, band director, uh, sorry, uh, conductor, band leader, educator, and a composer. Um, he sort of spearheads the ensemble. Uh, you might recognise the name, the Jazz Group Mothership Orchestra, which uh, pl uh, had played a lot of gigs uh, prior to COVID um, shutting the place down. Um, but he's also, uh, you know, here, there, and everywhere, playing with a lot of amazing musicians. So, without further ado, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to David Thieke. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> no worries. Um, are you okay if I call you Dave? Or yeah, you would... um, yeah, just as long as you call me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Um, so we'll just start with a bit of an icebreaker. We do this with all the guests. Um, just out of curiosity, what sort of got you into saxophone? What was sort of the impetus that sort of drove you towards this particular instrument? Well, um, interesting question. Because <laughs> um, I was playing the baritone um, horn in the school band. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and classical piano. My downstairs neighbor was a piano teacher in my fourth grade. Um, a primary school teacher was the band mistress. So she, you know, got everyone in playing instruments. And, and the school band didn't actually have any saxophones at that particular time. It was more of a brass band sort of thing. And we got these two shiny new saxophones turned up. And I remember um, uh, Miss Lewis showing us these, these instruments. <laughs> and it was the most beautiful looking thing I'd ever seen for a, like a 10-year-old boy. I, I just wanted it. I wanted to get my hands on it, you know. Nice. So that's so it was purely aesthetics, nothing to do with any profound, um, you know, interest in the instrument or, or how it sounded or anything like that. It's just that I thought it looked beautiful. <laughs> nice. Well, <that's> certainly, uh, <laughs> hey, look, it, it does look cool. So I'm not going to argue with that at all. Um, now, in terms of uh, sort of your early days learning the instrument and, um, you know, starting playing saxophone uh, and, you know, leading up towards, you know, uh, we became a little bit more advanced and, you know, did your undergrad studies and masters and whatnot. Can you tell us a bit about sort of your educational journey on the saxophone, sort of where you started, uh, where you ended up and were there any sort of uh, particular influential teachers you came across along the way or experiences or sort of ensemble op opportunities that you had during this time? Um, okay. Yeah. So um, I was fortunate enough to get into the conservatorium high school on piano. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I didn't even plan to audition for the con high school, but my, my sixth grade teacher sort of put me in, you know, unbeknownst to myself. And so I did the, I did the test of the audition and I got in and you needed a second instrument. And I only really been playing the saxophone for a few months. And so, um, I got to study with, I've, I've, his surnames escaped me, Neville. Um, he was a clarinet, um, teacher of the conservatory and quite famous in the classical world. Um, oh, Neville Thomas. Yeah. Neville Thomas, of course. Yeah. yeah. And so he was, um, he was my first like a uh, real saxophone teacher. You know, oh, wow. I had some, you know, a couple of local high school students sort of show me, you know, you know, show me how to get around, I suppose, up in Newport, up, up, up in the northern beaches. But until I actually started with Neville, I had no idea what, how it worked, you know, what was required. And it was my second instrument at the con too. So I really needed to, you know, put in some hard yards. Let's put it that way. Um, after that, um, I left the con high school and went to my local high school, Pittwater High School, which had a really big... Um, rock band program mm -hmm. and so I, I came across a um a great um young jazz musician called uh, chris crotman um mm -hmm. he's not young anymore but at the time he was young and um he helped me out taught me a bit about charlie parker a little bit how to improvise showed me a few chords and scales and and also changed the way that um that i was addressing the instrument because with neville um it had been all about being quite um controlled and very and firm and tight and whereas Chris was more about getting a big open sound. So that was a big eye opener for me. I realized, um, Chris sort of introduced me to the, a, a wider range of expression. So, okay. um, yeah, I suppose, for, you know, which turned me on. And then after that, I went to the con and I got to study with Don Burrows, nice. um, who was my sort of, you know, first real jazz teacher, I suppose. 
And then I um, had a mentor called Gordon Briscoe, who's an incredible American saxophonist who um, was in Woody Herman's band and he was a Nitro Day's musical director. He was um, James Brown's MD for a little while as well, actually. Yeah, right. Yeah, he also played the piano, but he was an incredible musician, um, film scorist and composer and great saxophonist. So he was the one that really got me, really got me started. Nice. On my path, I suppose, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you sort of had a very interesting journey there and um, seemed to have uh, encountered uh, a lot of interesting characters and uh, from different sort of viewpoints musically as well, which would be really interesting. Yeah. I just forgot someone really important. <laughs> um, Carl Lochnan um, was also my teacher at the conservatorium. Right. So, um, so as well as studying with Don, I got, I got to speak to Cole, who, of course, studied firsthand with Joe Allard. Mm. And so Cole really, really helped me, you know, to get into playing the, the horn the way I wanted to play. Yeah, no, I, I've also I studied with Cole back in the day and um, he was really sort of uh, knowledgeable, those experience with Joe Allard, particularly, um, you know, developing tone and control and all that stuff was really, um, yeah, an eye-opener for me as well and I'm sure it was for you too. Oh, yeah, and we, um, we at, at the Conservatorium Jazz course where I teach, um, mm. we direct all, all almost all of our first-year students to Cole mm -hmm. um, so that they get them, you know, so they get that relaxed approach to playing the instrument. From the word go, yeah, so. he sort of sets them up. <laughs> yeah, saves yeah, yeah. me do it, saves me doing it later. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Yeah. Um, now, um, yeah, obviously you know you went through the con and yeah had these amazing teachers and um, uh, experiences and stuff. Did you pursue any additional studies or um, sort of educational experiences overseas once you finished at the con? Or um, yeah, I, I did a um, I did a like a I was a guest lecturer like a gastura um, not lecturer sorry student um, in Germany. Okay. So I did a little bit of composition study in Detmold, at the Detmold Hochschule for Music. Mm -hmm. But most of my international um, sort of education experiences came from when people would come to Australia to perform. And right. I'd, I'd be that guy, you know, I'll pick them up from the airport, I'll drive them around, take them out to dinner, have a few drinks, you know, hopefully get a lesson, um, you know, a little bit of advice about what I was doing. So I was very fortunate to meet some great saxophone players by doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, like, you know, the Bob Shepard was a big, big, um, early mentor of mine as well. Like, you know, oh, and, wow. um, yeah. And I ended up recording a record with him later and saw him at, in LA at the start of last year and we had a jam session at his house. So, you know, these relationships, they, you know, they grow. Mm. But when I was young, yeah, that, that was another thing. So like, you know, I managed to spend a little bit of time with Vincent Herring and, and, um, there was Bob Berg, you know, yep. and, um, Lee Konitz did some stuff at the con too. And I, I remember having yeah, right. a, a drink with him and, you know, trying to pick his brain. So it was, for me, it was a lot of that. It was like trying to meet the older musicians who are here from Europe or America and just try and pick their brains and talk to them. And if I could get one little snippet of knowledge or something that would change the way I was thinking about it, then that was sort of, yeah, that was my sort of higher, edu higher education, I suppose. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Um, so out of all of these sort of amazing experiences that you had as, um, you know, learning off different people and stuff, um, yeah. Was there a particular standout lesson or experience from one of these people that sort of been a, um, uh, you know, either been an influence on how you are as a musician today or something that sort of really stuck with you in your mind, um, like to this day from in those early days? Um, no. <laughs> it's a short I, I view it more as a, just a, you know, sort of a, a, a sum of lots of different parts. I yeah. remember my first lesson with Cole Lockman, um, where he sort of, really showed me how to you know all the things I've been doing wrong with my embouchure um and I remember that was a that this journey took many months but that was that was a bit of an eye-opener mm -hmm. also my first lesson with the great late Tom Burroughs um was also um quite interesting for me because he talked a lot about breathing and mm -hmm. he felt that I was quite constrained and he, he did a lot of I mean you know probably wouldn't be allowed now but he used to you know, put his hands around my diaphragm and show me where, you know, and, and actually bring my attention to where the air needed to be. Okay. And so that was quite, you know, that was really, really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. um, and Don had had a lot of arthritis problems as well from not breathing properly and not being shown how to breathe properly when he was a young musician. So, and he attributed that to, um, you know, his lack of sort of thought and, and, and knowledge about breathing. So I suppose those two lessons were probably the, the biggest ones for me. Right. Okay. Uh, in general, it's always been little bits and pieces from lots of different sources. Yeah, you sort of like pick and choose the, the good bits and then make your own thing out of it. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah exactly. nice um it's funny you should say that about don because we had um andrew robertson on here a couple of weeks ago and okay. he was mentioning the exact same thing about the the diaphragm and um you know getting your breathing sorted so that, that's interesting yeah yeah it's really he was great like that and really warm and he was such a busy musician i mean he had his own tv shows and he was touring and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but he always always had a bit of time and and energy for the younger students you know particularly if you're interested which i was and so you know he was great he was a great mentor yeah. nice um now in terms of just your um general musical influences now i know it could be a bit of a loaded question but um <laughs> are, uh, are there any sort of standout um uh, musicians that have influenced you as a musician and um what about those particular players um is it that appeals to you as a player yeah okay uh, thanks nathan um yeah so but you know i'm a primarily a, a jazz musician so mm -hmm. i've there's the, you know, the standard, I suppose, a lot of them, um, Sonny Rollins and Dexter Gordon were always a big turn on for me for their sound and their expressiveness. Um, I loved the virtuosity of John Coltrane. Um, I was nuts about him for, for years. I transcribed so many of his solos and I was really into that. Um, not so much now. I still love Train, but like, um, and then I moved into onto Wayne Shorter, who I found mm -hmm. to be um, quite um, not a, you know, I hope I'm not speaking out of school. I never was impressed by his virtuosity as a saxophone player, but I love the, the compositional way in which he played and I loved his tone and I loved his tunes. And I just sort of viewed him as a sort of a well-rounded musician that didn't just play the hell out of the saxophone, but also did all these other things. So he was a big influence to me. Mm. Um, then I got into, um, Joe Henderson. Yeah. Uh, I remember I'd hardly heard him. Um, and, um, I remember having my mind blown by this um, concert, it was an illegal concert at the time. Someone had just had a bootleg tape of him performing in, in Baltimore with the Winton Kelly Trio. And it was some of the g most free free improvisation I'd ever heard. And he's such a virtuoso that I was just blown away. And then years later that got released as a record. So, uh, you know, so got my hands on that and, you know, listened to it so many times you could hear the B side. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, um, so those guys mainly then in sort of more recent years, I've, I've, I was really turned on by um, a, a saxophonist called Chris Potter. Yep. Um, also loved Kenny Garrett on the alto. And mm -hmm. um, also there's a guy that came on the scene about 10 years ago called Mark Turner, who sort of reinvented mm -hmm. the way that the, the horn was playing too. He's very, he's very sort of precise and, and, and cool and clean, but also really, quite astonishing harmonically so i found him to be a real real influence on on me um there's just so many now like this yeah. is the thing I, I i'm sure it's the same in your, in your scene right there's just so many young virtuosos popping up all the time and it's you know you, yeah you, it's you, hard you, to it's hard to pinpoint you know a couple exactly and you know sort of you go through phases as well like who you're listening to but you know yeah. it's just it's sort of interesting to hear sort of what sort of things have sort of you know been you know, uh, sort of in your core listening, I guess, um, throughout the years. Yeah. And there's a couple of others um, I'd like to mention too. There's a great um, a New York tenor player, George Garzone, mm -hmm. who I had the fortune, good fortune to hang out with and meet um, a couple of times. Um, I loved his sound and that was a big thing for me. And then there was another tenor player, Jerry Bigonzi, who's not really particularly well known, um, but for the for jazz tenor players, he's a bit of a sort of an unsung hero. So mm. I, I love him. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I heard him play, but never met him, unfortunately. But uh, well, hopefully one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. If the borders ever reopen, maybe I'll yeah have to <laughs> list of people I want to meet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now, um, early in your career, um, you uh, rose to prominence, um, you know, as a player, and you also um, made your name uh, through a variety of um, uh, as a sort of. Uh, quote, tour de force of the saxophone. Um, you were a finalist in the 2002 National Jazz Awards, the 2004 Friedman Fellowship, and a triple nominee for the Bell Australian uh, Awards, which is uh, probably one of the most prestigious awards out there for jazz musicians. Um, can you tell us a bit about uh, these experiences, uh, particularly like, you know, working towards the National Jazz Awards and the Friedman Fellowship? Like, um, like you know just talk us through that experience and you know what sort of thing did you learn from you know being involved in these uh particular events okay um well it's a, it's a long time <laughs> ago i just realized it's like 18 years ago um oh we don't count the years yeah yeah no that's good um well with the national jazz awards um like it's um i think it still has this prestige about it um 
I mean, I was, I was, only, I, I made it into the final, so I was one of ten saxophone players. I didn't make it through the three saxophonists that won it the year that I was there was um, a Jamie Oliver's, uh, Roger Manon's one, Jamie Oliver's came second, and the great Blaine Whitaker came third. So mm. it was an incredible caliber. But what it made me realize is there are so many good saxophone players, particularly in Australia, at, and at, even at that time, there's um, there was some other guys, um, Graham Blevins, and you know. Um, I think Matt Ottingham was in the finals as well. And just a whole bunch of great musicians that have, you know, sown their seeds all over the world. So for me, I, I just made me realize I was just one of, you know, lots of saxophone players who were aspirational and were trying to get really good. And, and so that was inspiring. I remember mm -hmm. um, we all stayed in the same motel in Wangaratta. Yeah. And um, there was 10 motel rooms and you, all you could hear was quavers, right? Everyone's just warming up, <laughs> practicing and blah, blah, blah. And as soon as I started playing, I did this bang on the door, you know, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and, but they're only joking. It was just the guys next door, you know. Yeah, fun. right. But um, so it was, it was an inspiring time. But also for me, like, I think I was, I'd been living in Europe and I came home for the National Jazz Awards. It meant so much to me to be involved in it, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but the performance was amazing. Like it was, it was recorded. There was a thousand people in the audience. There was a great band. It was just the whole sort of thing around it was um, just the aesthetic that surrounded it was really inspirational to me. And I was quite honored to be involved. And the Freemans, well that, you know, James Muller won it the year that I was in it. Um, <laughs> you, you know, maybe it's this is a saxophone thing. So maybe not that many people know him, but he's, he's one of Australia's great, great jazz masters mm. really. Yeah. So, but that was, you know, that was a great experience to play my own music at the Opera House, um, original music with the, you know, an audience. I, I loved it, you know. These things are great. I love these little things. I mean, you know, I've, I've just been part of it, never been a winner of any of these things, but it's just, you know, it, it, it gives you these little goals, these little sort of milestones that you can, you can press towards and practice for that I think the scene really needs at the moment. Yeah. Hmm. But I also, um, the other sort of benefit of being involved in these things is also just, um, as you said before, like, you know, being aware of, you know, how many great, you know, talented musicians are actually in your own backyard and be able yeah. to interact with them and, you know, sort of uh, develop, you know, relationships with these people that sort of last beyond the those sort of um, events and, you know, work on geek scenes, I, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. I, you made a lot of lifelong friends out of that thing. But the other thing, too, is I realised, um, particularly the National Jazz Awards, is how diverse it is. And okay. so, like, you know, everybody was sounding like themselves. And, and so that was really inspirational as well. Like, so even though it was a competition, the, you can't really compete with someone who's doing something in a completely different way to you, you know? Yeah. So it, that was also a bit of an eye opener too. It was just like steady the course, you know, try and stay true to, you know, my goals, which were trying to play with a big sound and be creative and rhythmically interesting. And, you know, and that's, that's, you know, it's, it was like a lesson that sort of solidified my own identity as a saxophone player, I suppose, being involved in something like that. Nice. Okay, yeah. cool. Now, um, uh, your uh, sort of, uh, lack of a better word, rap sheet of um, uh, players that you've worked with sort of reads like, um, you know, a bit of a who's who <laughs> in terms of the jazz world. Like, you've worked with some amazing musicians, uh, Marie Schneider, Chris Potter, Jim McNeely, Bob Shepard, as you said before, Mike Knott, uh, Florian Ross, Judy Bailey, uh, Kristen Bernardi, uh, sorry, Kristen, yeah, Kristen Bernard, Bernardi, uh, Bernardi, yeah. uh, sorry, um, Dave Panicki, um, James Moller, Sean Whelan, like just the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, and, you know, in terms of festivals, like you've worked um, you know, like at a lot of the major festivals, both here and as well as a few uh, uh, pivotal ones overseas as well. Um, out of all of these experiences, are there any sort of, highlights that you have uh in your memory uh being involved in uh, as a like any sort of performances that you found to be sort of sticking in your mind as being an absolute sort of highlight or most memorable sort of experience that's okay, a hard I, one i know <laughs> no you know that no that's um thank you thanks thanks nathan um yeah it is a it, it is a hard one i mean i should mention that most of those um the artists that i worked with was um i was the band leader of the jazz group mothership orchestra Mm -hmm. And so we would um, we would collaborate with these musicians. We'd rehearse together for a week or two, and then we'd go on tour around Australia with the big band. So that that was the that's the context in which I worked with these great players. I think the highlight for me was um, we did a gig at the Melbourne Festival as part of the Mothership's um, 10th anniversary tour, and mm -hmm. we we um, we brought over this young musician um, Darcy James Argue um, to tour Australia. So we did 15 concerts around Australia and New Zealand with Darcy, mm -hmm. and his music was so hard. I mean, we worked our asses off to try and 
you know, get it sounding as good as we could. And, you know, everyone in the band was committed. And um, so we got there. But just before we were about to go on tour, I got contacted by the Melbourne Festival and said, look, we'd love to have you play with Darcy at the festival, but we really want Maria Schneider to play at the festival as well. And how would you feel about, you know, backing her? And we hadn't worked with Maria. So, you know, of course, it was enticing, incredibly enticing. But it was right in the middle of a tour, you know. So, um so we, we managed to get a couple of days rehearsal in Melbourne with Maria and it was, mm-hmm. it was wonderful. And then we did the first half of the concert was this incredible music with Darcy James Argy. It was in odd times and really complex and had elements of Balkan and classical and, you know, it was really full on. Mm. And then we went off stage and then we came back on 15 minutes later and played with Maria Schneider, you know, and, and Darcy's music is very, very well considered, like really particular and the way he rehearsed us was quite, intense and exacting mm-hmm. and like even when we we're on tour after rehearsing for two weeks and we'd still rehearse for an hour an hour and a half every afternoon at the sound check so he was like he was almost like a scientist in the way that he approached his music with no d- disrespect because it's beautiful music right mm. whereas maria was more like a um she's more like a sorceress you know <laughs> okay. yeah i know i remember in one tune like she cut us off with a pinky Really? You know? Yeah, it was unbelievable. And she was almost dancing in front of the band. She was very exacting in the rehearsals. Like told us exactly what she wanted, but she would she would get us to she would get us to perform based on anecdotes and and she was evoking imagery and you know, there was one mm-hmm. tune that we did where she was talking about the wind blowing over cornfields in the Midwest in America where she's from. And so she was trying to get the horns to, to create these waves of sound over the Do you know what I mean? I'm yeah, getting goosebumps yeah, yeah. just thinking about it. But um and so that night we we did that we worked with this mad scientist and then came on into this beautiful enchanting you know where the music was full of beauty and it was just it was just a, it's, I, I think that's the highlight of my career absolutely wow yeah. oh, that sounds like a fantastic experience and have the opportunity to work with um two amazing musicians and just you know two un- unique approaches um yeah would have been very interesting. Now that brings in very nicely to this next point that I'm actually going to talk about, which is actually uh, the Jazz Group Mothership Orchestra itself. Oh, now, okay. um, for those who don't actually know about this uh, fantastic ensemble, could you tell us a little bit about the group and you know how it came about, and maybe some of the players that have been involved in it during the, the over the years? Okay, um, so the Jazz Group Mothership Orchestra is it's a bit of a hiatus at the moment. Like um, I've, I've well, like most years. things, I'd imagine. Yeah, but, you know, we're, we're still going. But um, I started the Australian National Jazz Orchestra a few years ago, and that's sort of become my main focus um, mm-hmm. in recent times. But the, the mothership is a big part of, you know, a lot of things that have happened. Um, and it started um, where there was an association of musicians in Sydney in the, um, in the 90s and early 2000s called the Jazz Groove Association. And I was involved in that and setting it up and, and, you know, helping to run it and setting up a record label and all sorts of things. Anyway, one of the artistic directors came to us and said, could you put together a big band for our Christmas party? Right. And um, we've been talking about it for years. And so I rang all my mates and everyone had like an old big bad chart from when they were at the con under their bed. And so we, you know, we turned up to the first rehearsal with all this original music and some, you know, classic stuff we liked. And we just, just managed to get it together. I think we had three rehearsals with three different drummers and, um, and the first gig, I've got a recording of it. It was, it was dreadful. The spirit, <laughs> the spirit was there, Yep. but the, um, but the, um, the yeah they're just we were loose and yeah and, right <laughs> yeah it's hard to explain it was a christmas party as well and you know everyone was drinking and it was just it was you know yeah. but but we did it <laughs> <laughs> and then after that we had a bit of a chat afterwards and um and about whether we wanted to keep it going and what we wanted to try and achieve and and then over the next few years it evolved into something which is a lot more um serious i suppose and mm-hmm. yeah um it was an interesting band because it wasn't like it wasn't the first core musicians in Sydney. Okay. No disrespect to myself and, and, and the others in the ensemble. Like there's some really fine musicians there, but, but we weren't the people that were doing the, the tours and the theater shows and the, and the, you know, and um, so, but it was people that were really passionate about music mm-hmm. and that had really interesting sounds and really interesting approaches to, to their music. And so it was almost like, you know, maybe the ensemble playing wasn't great to start with, but I knew that these musicians were of a caliber that they would learn those skills and grow. So the, the band grew from being pretty rough, a rough diamond to mm-hmm. something that was a lot more sophisticated over a few years. And we had a couple of key projects that really helped that. Um, we did a record with Mike Nock, um, mm-hmm. the Australian pianist and uh, New Zealand Australian pianist. And, and we did a music of his um, 
a record of his music. Um, got some funding for that, and so it was the first time the band went into a studio, and that was a um, that was a big deal. And then we sort of took on this for the years after that. We took on this sort of model where we'd get a guest artist to come and join us, and then we'd we'd tour. So we're getting the experience of playing lots and lots of gigs with the same musicians, which is really rare in a big band these days. And so I suppose that's that was one of the reasons um, why the band became what it became. I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's interesting. And then you were also saying that uh, that your most sort of recent project uh, was the Australian National Jazz Orchestra. So how does that differ to the the Mothership Orchestra? Well, the Australian National Jazz Orchestra is focused on the music of Australian composers and musicians, right? Um, so that's a big difference. Whereas the Mothership Orchestra, we we just we we followed whatever artistic path we felt like. Okay. Yeah, so if you know we wanted to work with Maria, then we we try and make that happen. Or if we wanted to do a, a like a pretty free record with Scott Tinkler, and you know we just we just did whatever we wanted. You know, whereas um, the ethos behind the National Jazz Orchestra is to try and do the music of of Australian composers, and also brings together the um, you know some of the best Australian musicians from around the country into one sort of ensemble. So we only get together every every year or two. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, you guys uh, uh, had recently done a a video project, I believe, with that ensemble. Was that correct, or? Um, yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, we a little, did. Little we, um, bit of one. Yeah. Yeah, we did a um, we uh, we played at the, Con- the Sydney Colony Jazz Festival a couple of years ago, and we videoed yep. um the yeah we made a live recording and then videoed it as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, did that uh, any particular composers of uh, uh that you sort of featured on that particular one or? Um, yeah, that was Nick Mulder. He was a, a Melbourne-based um, trombonist and composer. So he um, okay. he composed a suite of music um, featuring uh, Matt Joddle, the trumpet player, and Roger Manning's the... Well, he lives in New Zealand, right? Let's be honest. But yeah. he was in Australia for a long time. So we dragged him back and um, got him involved as well. So, yeah, but that was by Nick Mulder, an Australian composer. And then we did one a couple of years ago, which hasn't been released yet, um, by Judy Bailey. Nice. So we played Judy's music um, with a band from around Australia. So, yeah, so that's where we... Um, yeah. Cool. Nice. Um, now, I was reading um, on a bio uh, that uh, a couple of years ago, you were actually um, doing some research um, <laughs> into uh, what what is quote has been said, uh, the infrastructure of the jazz scene within Australia. Yeah. Um, now, this is an interesting topic because um, I can't really find a lot of information about it online per se, but just sort of be interested in sort of hear what, uh, what this sort of research topic involved and what sort of areas were you looking at in terms of this? Well, I wish I could enlighten you (laughs) because that was, um, that was, that was my intent to do that research, but, um, but I did, we did identify a few little things, um, through, uh, conversations with my colleagues at the con about what was needed. And, um, and one of the results of that, those preliminary discussions was that we started the Sydney Conservatorium International Jazz Festival. Mm. Um, so we realized that there was a big need for um, a jazz festival in Sydney. And I'd sat on a few boards over the years um, that tried to get funding from the New South Wales government um, for the Sydney International Jazz Festival. And it didn't happen. There was lots of reasons why um, why it didn't work out political and otherwise. But, but finally, um, we identified that that was a big thing. So there wasn't a lot of pathways for young musicians in the jazz scene. Like they graduated and then they could, you know, maybe do a tour or record a record, but there wasn't sort of, keynote of events for them to perform at. So we were trying to change that a little bit. And um, so that was one of the reasons why the Con, Sydney Con Jazz Festival came about four years ago. Right. And yeah, you, as you said, you're sort of uh, one of the instrumental figures in sort of um, creating that festival. And, you know, you had some fantastic acts, uh, not only just uh, local talent uh, from uh, Sydney, but, you know, also from interstate and, of course, some overseas acts as well. Um, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about um, yeah, uh, some of the uh, performers you might have had as um, part of the festival? Yeah, we've had, we had Bill Frizzell last year, which was amazing. And mm-hmm. um, this year we were going to have the Avishai Cohen Trio, obviously, but the festival was cancelled due oh, to nice. COVID. Yeah. But um, Tony Malaby was one of the highlights. He's a great New York free saxophone player, which maybe some, of, some people know. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, Tony was, was great. Sandy Evans has performed with her group as well. Um, we had... I don't know. I, the list goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great, but you know, the con, the Sydney con is such a beautiful building, and and it's perfectly set up for a jazz festival. You know, five auditoriums all around the same atrium. There's a bar downstairs. It, it's, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's yeah, it's been going well, but it's sort of um, it's a good chance for the community to come together in one spot every year. I really hope it we can get it running in t- uh, 2021. 
Yeah. Now you, um, uh, as you've sort of mentioned before, you're a big advocate for building, you know, a sense of community. Like as I said, the the jazz festival there, you know, having an opportunity for younger players to, you know, get exposed to, um, you know, some great players as well as playing opportunities. And uh, you're mentioning earlier your association with um, being uh, sort of in the foundation of the the jazz groove uh, association as well. Um, in terms of your sort of it's a bit of a deep question, but yeah. Um, yeah, in comparison to sort of how we were pre-COVID to how we're looking to be now, and I know it's going to be early days, how would you like to see the scene sort of change or develop uh, based on sort of what's what's happened now and basically how could we rebuild? What would you think? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that's a... That's a... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's a big question. Look, one thing I've realised, and particularly um, talking to some of my colleagues um, in recent months, is how important the physical community is to music mm -hmm. making. Like, um, you know, there really is a strong scene, jazz scene in Sydney, and there's a lot of great jazz musicians and a lot of really wonderful people, and that inability to get together in person has been quite taxing on a lot of people. Now, the Jazz Groove Association was formed back in the 90s because there was already, and there still is a great um, organisation called the Sydney Improvised Music Association, which puts on heaps of great concerts. And, you know, I, I help them as well, and I'm on their board. And um, they do so many great things, but they were really focused at one stage on established artists, really good musicians like Dal Barlow and Sandy Evans and Ten Part Invention, all these really great ensembles from the 90s. But for the young guys at the time, like myself and Sean Whalen and Cameron Undy and, mm. you know, all our, all our friends, all our peers and colleagues there wasn't a lot of opportunity so a few of the guys got together i was i wasn't at the first meeting of the jazz group association um i came on board probably six months to 12 months later and, and moved it from being like an idea into you know a formal sort of um funded organization with the help of another great guy murray jackson mm -hmm. um and um and also the and you know, cameron only was involved at the time there were lots of great people involved but um, yeah, so, but that, that, that came about because this organization was presenting concerts for older musicians, more established musicians, but the younger musicians were missing out. And so, um, so one thing I'm realizing, and that was, that, was, that was a really big thing for our scene. Like, you know, we're, we had this Tuesday night gig, um, lots of people were there. We started a record label, which had almost a hundred releases. We we're getting funding from the government. We had this sort of collective clout, you know, like we could mm. organize meetings with the arts people, you know, Arts New South Wales and all these things that weren't happening before this started, started to happen. And I think that that could really be important to the scene moving forward after COVID for something like that to come, to come back, to get a musician's collective, which is focused on the needs of musicians and young musicians and emerging musicians and just trying to create, a, you know, that sort of, energy and momentum again, I think would be something that's really important. So something that sort of would be a nurturing sort of thing that sort of would help, um, well, as I said, like you just sort of have to rebuild almost from scratch, like this whole scene, which yeah. hopefully won't take too long, but yeah. yeah, it sounds like it would be the track to go, I guess. Yeah, we'll hope so. I mean, look, you know, I'm, 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 my, I'm, I'm too old. It's like, you know, <laughs> the Jazz River Association was, was done by people in their twenties, lots of energy and lots of enthusiasm and lots of new mm. ideas. And I think, yeah, I think that would be a really, a really good thing. You know, those, those organizations can really just, you know, um, help to build energy and, and, and opportunities for people that don't exist at the moment. So hopefully that's one way through this, you know, mm. yeah. Yeah. well, we'll fingers see. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Um, now moving on to your teaching now, um, you, you've, uh, 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 known as a, you know, a renowned educator as well as performer, um, and you're currently teaching at the Sydney con, um, via Brisbane at the moment. Cause yeah, by do, Zoom. Yeah. Via Zoom. Um, obviously a bit <laughs> frustrating, but, um, you have been at the con for several years and, uh, at one stage you were the head of the department and now you're just a senior, uh, well, not just, sorry, a senior lecturer of, uh, uh, the, in the jazz course. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a bit about your teaching philosophy in terms of like when you're uh, when you're sort of doing a one to one lesson, what sort of uh, approach do you take with students? What what is it sort of that you're wishing to impart with them and hopefully that they can take away from lessons with you? OK, um, well, I suppose at the core of my teaching philosophy is identifying each student, each individual student's needs mm -hmm. and where they want to grow and then tailoring how I deliver what I know to suit 
what they what they what they need. That's mm-hmm. uh, that's it. So in a individual tailored approach to to teaching. Okay. Um, I try and impart um, a good sense of sound and technique um, and an ability to be expressive for my students. And then um, after we, we cover those basics, who knows what they're going to do? And that's one thing I've realized. Like when I first started teaching 14 years ago at the con, it was like, everyone wants to be a great jazz player, you know? You know, they, they, wanted, they should be doing what I do which is play gigs and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Re- release records. And, you know, but then I realized that this is not the case for everybody. And that there's so, so many different pathways and, and areas of interest and people's curiosity is always so different, you know? And so we, um, in consultation with my colleagues, Phil Slater and Simon Barker, um, in particular, um, we decided a few years ago that just trying to just give the musicians tools that they can apply in any situation was going to be our best way of moving forward. Mm-hmm. So I suppose in terms of the philosophy of my teaching, it's, it's twofold to, to identify the needs and areas that need to be improved on with the students and try and help them with my knowledge as best as I can mm-hmm. and tailor you know, the lessons to their individual needs. But secondly, also is to prepare them for, for anything because music's changed already so much since mm-hmm. I was a young musician in the 30 years I've been practicing as a musician, it's already evolved. Um, it's regressed in some ways too, like in terms of opportunities, but there's so much more demanded of a jazz saxophonist now than there was when I first started. You know, we used to be able to play four, four, you learn a few tunes, you, you know, you played your, your heart out. And if it was in time and it sounded good, then that was fine. But now these guys are playing, they're playing all sorts of odd times and different scales and, you know, extended techniques. It's probably like classical saxophone as well. Right. This yeah, thing's happening now that you would never have dreamed of doing twenty years ago. Well, it's know? true. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same, you know, and it's it's great. It's the world's moving forward, and people are curious, you know. But how do I know what my students are going to need in ten years? Well, I think they're going to need to be able to play the instruments as well as they can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and maybe have developed an attitude of of just trying to be excellent with everything they do. Right. Yeah. So. No. I, Maybe that sounds shallow. I don't know, but that's that's my that's my philosophy. No, I think I think it's very sound. Like you know, you got it's got like a being in the scouts could be prepared for anything. And as you say, it's an ever evolving scene. So you know, having the the skill set in order to adapt is really important and crucial. Were you a scout? Were you a scout, Nathan? Oh hell no! no I was really. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't get my music badge though. But, um, yeah, and no, I was particularly when I was a kid. I had some great times actually. You know, up until about twelve or thirteen. Yeah. But, all right well i'll let the uh sydney scout network know about that one you could be up there next um now just uh sort of leading on to that um in terms of uh say you, you've got some students who uh recently graduate and you know are approaching the big bad music world um on their own um what sort of advice would you give uh young musicians looking to uh make a name well not necessarily well i guess yeah make a name for themselves in the scene and just sort of get into the scene and get into the gig circuit Um, My first piece of advice is to make sure that the thing that you're selling, which is music, Mm. is of the highest possible quality. (laughs) That's, you know, that's, that's number one. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, um, try and find something that is not already being done. Mm -hmm. So for me, like when I was young, um, there wasn't a lot of guitar and tenor saxophone quartets you know, and then not because I did it, but then a few years later, there was a lot more of those. And so then I started the, the mothership orchestra because there wasn't any creative big bands happening. Mm-hmm. And there was, you know, there, that was something that people wanted and we wanted as musicians. And so just find things that, you know, that aren't happening and try and create those things with you, with your music. Now, obviously it's got to be, it's got to, you know, it's got to fulfill your curiosity and, and what have you, but that's, that, that's, that, that's my main advice. I mean, you know, I run a music business skills course at the con and we get into more specifics about, you know, how to actually do these things. But I, I think essentially the, that's the key. Just make sure the music's as good as it possibly can be. And then two, try and identify gaps. It, it sounds like a, bi- a business speak, but uh, identify gaps in the market mm. <laughs> and fill them, you know? So if no one's playing ballads, learn how to play a ballad beautifully. Like if no one's 
playing, you know, like, you know, smooth jazz sax and you like that, there you go. You know what I mean? There's room for everybody in this world. Yeah. Just got to just gotta try and, you know, push yourself towards where it's not already being done. That's my advice to the, to the young guys. Okay. And girls. Sure. Yep, sure, sure. Mm. Um, now, um, I hate to say it, but uh, the hot topic uh, in the last uh, however months it's been now uh, is yes. COVID-19. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, throwing a spanner in the works for, you know, life in general. Um, in terms of um, how it's impacted you and um, uh, obviously, you know, being uh, stuck in, well, I wouldn't say stuck because Queensland's a lovely place to be, um, to go for the sunshine and beaches. Yeah. But um, in terms of uh, having to adapt um, to the current situation, like obviously with Zoom teaching and things like that, um, it's yeah. been a learning curve for all of us. Yeah. Um, have What sort of uh, things or uh, uh, advice would you give for uh, sort of dealing with the current situation now and sort of, uh, I guess, to keep saying musically? Yeah, it's um, it's been a really interesting time, hasn't it? Mm. Um, I mean, I for one, um, I've I've really loved teaching one to one saxophone on Zoom. Okay. Like I know it's I know this sounds weird. It is a little bit weird. <laughs> I know, but no, for me it's been it's been really good. Like I, I mean, most weeks I try and have a a a, a, a um a lesson structure where uh, we do a new technique, um, and then they go away and record themselves. Um, working on a jazz standard or repertoire, whatever it is they're doing, employing those new techniques, they send it to me a day or two before the next lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is something that wouldn't happen normally. Yep. Normally they just turn up and knock on your door at Tuesday, 12 o'clock. And then you, you've got them for 50 minutes and then you don't see them again until, you know, and so, and so they, they, I've been trying to get them to send me stuff um, a day or two in advance. Then I critique it. I plan my next lesson, which is, you know, you know, even though I, 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 we do, um, with my students, we do semester, you know, outcome plans and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, the reality is as a, as a teacher, you know, like you, you, you're so busy that you'll probably give, you know, 10 or 15 minutes thought to your next student before they get there, you know, mm. but with this, I'm getting a chance to hear them, hear how they're progressing, actually write down some critique and then plan my next lesson, which is going to happen in a day's time and try and cover those issues. And I can actually think about ways. So as a one-to-one -one teacher, other than the fact that I can't, um, see their breathing and you know which are some pretty big things right but mm. but in terms of just musical the musical and harmonic side of things it's been really really helpful okay. and my, i've noticed my students have developed really well orally um so they've been um they've been picking up things that i'm showing them or teaching them because we can't do it in person we don't have a piano they can't see my my hands so they've in that way it's been actually really quite enlightening um ensemble teaching obviously has just been completely just yeah it's yeah. a bit sort of on hiatus at the moment a drag yeah, yeah. i mean um but fortunately at the sydney con we're, we're back to um back to live ensembles in a couple of weeks which is going to be great i know the kids in the big bands at the con we've got four big bands at the sydney con mm -hmm. and i know they're raring to go so we had a little recording project in um in august um, um late july early august with the big bands and everybody and the, and the small ensembles and everybody just loved getting back together in the same room so i think that's one thing that's almost impossible to teach um online mm. um but in, in in terms of other covid practice um i've been doing um for impro classes i've been preparing um videos um so yeah, yeah so i i'd normally do a lot of my teaching with a whiteboard and a whiteboard marker and my saxophone so i demonstrate things write it up explain you know so it's a lot of diagrammatic and um so you know so you're seeing things and hearing them at the same time mm -hmm. um and so with the video lectures that's been interesting too it takes a lot of time to prepare but I've been able to get have all my materials on hand and then put them up on the screen really quickly, and so in that way, the improvisation's been good too. Yep. And then students would be sending me videos and they give them feedback so the whole class can read it, and we're all been learning from each other's mistakes and and gains. So, so that's been that's been pretty good. But it's just um, I'm same for everybody. I think the preparation time and the, and the actual amount of time it takes to deliver your teaching has just yeah, the workload's tripled almost. Yeah, well, I know for my one-hour lectures, it's usually four or five hours of recording, editing, and preparing videos. So, Jeez. yeah, but, you know, it, it is what it is, you know. Like, it's just great that people, kids are still, you know, curious about music and still want to learn, even though the world is how it is at the moment. It's quite inspiring, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. 
for sure. Yeah. And look, uh, it's not going to be like this forever, thankfully. So, you know, just got to wait it out and do what we can in the meantime, I guess. I think um, it was before we went on air, wasn't it? We were talking about, um, I went to a gig in Brisbane a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. A great, yeah. Um, James Sandon, he's a great tenor player, lives up here in Brisbane. He's lived in Perth and Melbourne. He's just a wonderful player. And so I went to hear him and there was like a hundred people there. And I was drinking beer and, you know, between sets, there was that vibe where people are having a drink and talking about how great the music was. And it was electric, you know, and I, I realized that, you know, um, I think everybody's really missed that, you know? Mm. Yeah. Did I did I see a Nexus gig or some that you guys where did you was at the City Recital Hall or something with no audience or uh we did a, you, yeah. it was for the Australian Chain Music Festival. Oh that's right, that's right. And yeah. um yeah, there was like um the sound guy and the video guy and um the M C. Yeah. So wow. yeah. Yeah, it's 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 weird. And a lot it's of people weird. look at things retrospectively as well too, you know, so you know, you'll, you'll do something like I did this thing with the Australian national jazz orchestra. We did one of those Brady bunch videos, you know, mm -hmm. um, really complex music. And it, geez, it, was, it was a learning curve, but we got there. And, and then in months later, someone will write you and say, Oh, I just heard that. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, people are getting to music in their own time, but I, yeah, I really hope it comes back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Um, like, as you say, like, I think people are itching to sort of go and see a live band um particularly more so now than ever i think as you say they're just sort of retrospectively looking back at it and yeah. um you know just missing the the good old days as they say um one thing i have learned too during this time was um, f um find find something interesting um outside of music yep um and also trying to um trying to keep a sense of community going where possible like i i, I designed this um jazz card game um, earlier in the year, just as a, a joke, I was playing another card game with my kids and they said, oh, imagine if we made a card game like this, you know, based on granny's cooking. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, my mum's Scottish. And so we started thinking about making this game with all this Sc Scottish cuisine. When the kids left, I started thinking, oh, I wonder if we can make this game using jazz. <laughs> and so, and it was really good. It, it was, it was completely unrelated to, even though it's a jazz game, it was unrelated to making music. And, mm. and then I started inviting, you know, cause we had rules up here in Brisbane about how many people could come over to your house and all that sort yeah, of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So I'd have five people come over and test run the game, cook them dinner. We'd listen to records. We'd play, we'd have a few drinks and, you know, just those little snippets of community and talking about the music scene as we remembered it and how we hoped it would be in the future was just really positive. So I think just trying not to feel too isolated, um, and just and having something outside of your work to keep you active and curious. Yeah, for sure. Helpful for me. I know that much. Yeah. Right. Now, funny you should say that because um, I was about to do a shameless plug uh, over oh. here. Well, don't, um, no, don't. They're sold out. Okay. <laughs> and well, I, I, and I, I, I never want to do it again. It took me about 20 <laughs> hours to like pack them into boxes and s shuffle them. And oh, yeah, anyway, go. Yeah, but it was, <laughs> uh, well, I have to say the packaging was immaculate. And I just, literally just before I came on here for this, um, I got my deck of the jazz game and uh, I'm very much looking forward to having a crack at it. And I believe uh, that was the final run. So if you are very fortunate to find it secondhand, um, I believe it'll be worth a mint in the near future. So just keep an eye out for it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there is a wait list on the Australian National Jazz Orchestra webpage. If I get like a 50 or 100 people want to call, I think it's about 30 people on there at the moment. If 50 or 100 people want to buy it, or maybe I'll do it again. But it was a joke. It was like a bit of fun with my mates. It was just something to, to get us through the, um, get us through the, you know, the sort of the big lockdown up here. And yeah, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I sold them in about 20 minutes. It was, I know uh, the first run just disappeared. And then the yeah. second run was the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I'd just, you know, forget about playing the saxophone and just manufacture card games from now on. <laughs> well, when Jazz Monopoly comes out, let me know. <laughs> yeah, the problem with Jazz Monopoly is there's no, there's no money. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Oh, you, you, play, you play with exposure dollars. Yeah, and doing favours for each other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Now, um, just before we finish up, I've just got one uh, at the tail end of the interview, but just a couple of quick questions to finish up. Yep. Uh, first of all, uh, the okay, this is a bit of a, a curveball, but we'll see how yep. we go with it. And I ask all the interviewees this one. Yep. Um, if you had 10 minutes and only 10 minutes to practice, what would it be and why? Okay. Um, so if I had 10 minutes to practice, um, I would just pick up my saxophone. I leave my saxophones out. You can mm -hmm. probably even see my tenor. Nice. Maybe. And I've got my alto behind there and I keep the woodwinds in the bedroom. 
Uh, no, no, it's what? <laughs> oh, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it's, it's a good spot. They, the, the acoustics in in the in the room sound better for the okay. piano flute. But um, ten minutes to practice. I pick up my horn. Um, that's why I leave them out because mm-hmm. I don't want to waste any time setting it up. And I just play a jazz standard for ten minutes. Okay. So whatever I'm singing, whatever I feel like playing, I'll just pick up, play, just unaccompanied, but keeping the time with my own playing and my articulation, and just play a tune for 10 minutes and i actually encourage my students to do that um as part of their practice routine okay so okay. the so the first thing they do i know there's some great practice routines out there and you know um but i've always felt that following your curiosity at, at for the first part of any any practice routine is really important rather than feeling that you've got a task that you must accomplish you know like um exa- i mean obviously you need to warm up and w- what have you yeah sure mm-hmm. but you know, but that's cool. You can do a few stretches, breathe deeply, you know, whatever, but just follow your curiosity for the first part of your practice routine. And then wherever that takes you, you'll find that you'll be so much more engaged and energized about what it is that you're doing for that particular session than you would be if you felt that you were doing a chore. That's how I feel about it anyway. So that's what I do if I have 10 minutes and often at the con, that's how I practice. Mm. So, you know, like in between students. Yeah. Or I've got, yeah, exactly. Student leaves 10, 10, I've got 10 minutes till the next one. Do I sit at the computer? No, I pick up the saxophone. I'll play it for five or 10 minutes until there's a knock on the door. And then, you know, then we go. All right. Nice one. Um, All right. So, uh, Dave, thanks very much for your time this morning. Um, It was really insightful and so really uh, interesting stories there and um, some things I didn't know um, reading up on you. So, you know, it was really informative for me and also just some really um, uh, interesting perspectives on um, how you sort of approach music. So thank you for that very much. Um, Thanks for um, organising it too. Like I've been enjoying the other ones that you've been doing. So thank you. Oh, no worries. And as I said, very, very absolutely um, thrilled that you could, you know, uh, set aside a bit of time for us this morning. Um, now, in terms of um, yeah, upcoming projects and sort of keeping in the loop with, you know, what's new with Dave Thieke, what's the sort of, uh, well, first of all, are there any sort of projects on the horizon? And if so, what are some uh, websites or things to look out for in terms of keeping up to date with what you're up to? Uh, my, my big um, my big project at the moment is the Australian National Jazz Orchestra, even though we're not doing much. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's what I'm fo- going to be focused on over the next couple of years and trying to make that an ongoing concern. We had an Australian National Youth Jazz Orchestra that was meant to debut in June. Oh yeah, that's right. After years of planning, so that was that was a heartbreaker for not just for myself and the other artistic directors, Mace Francis and Nadia Nordhaus, but um, but it was also for the students. You know, the first time it ever happened, and then literally they auditioned. We did the auditions, and then the next day we had to call it off. So. Out. Yeah, I know. There's been a few heartbreakers this year, that's for sure. But, it, you know, but the Australian National Jazz Orchestra is where um, dot .com is where most of my projects are coming up. Another big thing we're doing with the con is we've got this great um, UK saxophonist called Will Vincent. I don't know whether you've heard him, but he is okay. unbelievable. But he's married to an Australian woman and they're, they're, stuck, in, um, they're stuck in Adelaide at the moment. So oh, wow. we've got a project where we just commissioned um, some of the world's great composers to arrange his music for the con big band. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to record that by the end of the year and maybe get some of that out as well. So they're two of the big things I've got planned at the moment. All right, nice. Well, I'll post a link to the uh, Australian uh, National Jazz Orchestra um, when I post this up there so people can yeah. check it out. And sign up for their card, for their card game as well. That's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you get around to it, for sure. Um, all right, well, Dave, thanks again very much for your time um, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, we'll be back next week with another saxophone player, of course, being the Sydney Saxophone Network. Um, but until then, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend and week. And um, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. And thanks again, Dave. Thanks, Nathan. See ya. See ya.